Hello and welcome to Railroad Journeys Around the World. There can be few people who don't occasionally dream about escaping from the stress and strain of everyday life to their own relaxing island in the sun. Of course, for most of us, the reality is a compromise with all the family as we search for our ideal annual holiday spot. The answer for many thousands of people from all over Europe is to flock to the Mediterranean islands in search of sunshine, beautiful beaches and distinctive regional cuisine. Surely though, the ideal holiday island would feature all of these things in abundance. But also perhaps an interesting railway network that could be used to explore the island and provide a pleasant diversion from all that sunbathing, swimming and overeating. After viewing this program, you'll be spoiled for choice. The beautiful French island of Corsica, which is the fourth largest Mediterranean island, has a population of only 250,000 people, with most of the principal towns being situated close to the sea. Corsica is served by a single-track main line from Bastia to Ajaccio, which is connected with a branch line from Pontilecchia to Calvi. The island's meter gauge railway network is part of the state-owned SNCF system and in recent years has benefited from considerable new investment in rolling stock. The majority of the most popular beaches in Corsica are on the west coast and are well served by rail. The interior of the island is very mountainous, with its highest peak reaching over 2,700 metres. And as we shall see, this distinctive scenery has effectively shaped the development of the whole railway network. The northern terminus station at Bastia is situated close to the lengthy Toretta Tunnel, which bores deep under the old city. Today, standard power for all Bastia to Ajaccio services are these two-car Sule diesel hydraulic units, which were introduced in 1989. Bastia Depot was also the site of the main workshops until 1983, when a new facility was opened at Casamozza, some 22 kilometers south. The modern station building at Bastia was financed and built in 1982 when surplus railway land, including the branch to the harbour, was sold off. After traversing a rather dull and level coastal plain, shortly after leaving Casamozza, the line begins its dramatic climb into the mountains along the valley of the river Golo. On the final approach to Ponte Lecchia, the line parallels the branch from Calvi for a short distance before joining it just before the station. Most services are operated by Sule railcars in pairs, and it's comparatively unusual to see single units like this without a control trailer. Passengers from Ajaccio for the Calvi branch always have to change here, while any through trains to Calvi from Bastia will have to reverse here, usually adding or detaching a trailer in the process before continuing their journey. Approximately 30 minutes is timetabled between connections here, which out of season allows plenty of time to visit the station cafe. In high summer though, there's usually a scramble for passengers from Calvi trying to get a seat onwards to Ajaccio on an already well-filled train. Corsica is sometimes known as the scented isle, and the air is often heavy with the smell of pungent wild herbs and shrubs frequently emanating from the so-called turpentine plant.
Through trains from Calvi to Bastia will take around three hours, although late running, usually caused by animals on the track or even minor landslides, are common. Many of these typical stylish lattice girder viaducts were renewed in the late 1980s. Corsica's superb western coast is first glimpsed just before arriving at Ile Rouge. It's not usually as peaceful as this around here, but if you do want some solitude, then spring and autumn are often very quiet with plenty of glorious weather. The line effectively cuts off access to the sea as it skirts the promenade at Ile Rouge. In the summer months, the town and the nearby beaches can become very busy. station, which is situated at the western edge of this rambling town, dates from the 1890s and has a delightful sleepy feel about it. Although on occasions it can become fairly busy, as not only are there through trains to and from Pontilecchia to Calvi, but there's also an additional seasonal service to Calvi. This local frequent stop service is operated by these venerable single Renault ABH8 units that are semi-permanently coupled to a trailer. Control trailer XR526 was rebuilt from a diesel mechanical rail car purchased second hand from Réseau Breton in 1966, who themselves bought the original unit in 1947. The cab of the control trailer with its unusual driving position is surprisingly spacious, giving good all-round visibility. The power for this semi-permanently coupled pair is provided from the larger vehicle, which is a Renault ABH diesel mechanical unit. The other spare Renault unit and its control trailer were rebuilt from a rebodied BR railcar of 1938 vintage. Marketed as the Tramways de la Balagne, there are a total of nine local trains each way every day during the summer months. The usual journey time on this request stop service is around 45 minutes for the 22 kilometers from Ile Rus to Calvi. Although these elderly units often show a very respectable turn of speed as they rattle along some sections. The line cuts through some beautiful coastal stretches, giving passengers many enticing glimpses of deserted beaches that are impossible to reach by road. The very first rail cars arrived on the island as long ago as 1935, and they are of course ideal for these lightly constructed meter gauge lines. All told, Corsica has over 1,000 kilometers of coastline, ranging from large open sandy beaches to quiet secluded coves which can often be deserted even in August. This summer tourist operation would seem ideal for a potential steam service. Sadly though, the last steam passenger services ran in Corsica in 1951, and all steam was finally eradicated by 1956. Unfortunately, the entire fleet was gradually sold off for scrap, and although there's been some talk of summer tourist steam services, no serious effort has ever been made to import any suitable motive power.
many of the listed station halts a little more than a few bushes and are referred to in the special timetable by the name of the resort they serve, such as Club Horizon, Club Olympique or even Tennis Club. Lumio station, there's a brief pause to pass one of the X2001 rail cars with a rebodied BR trailer in tow, bound for Bastia. For many tourists, this almost hourly summer service along the coast provides the best method of local mobility, allowing them to escape from the more crowded resorts. These days there's no regular freight traffic as such along this section, but the rail cars often carry a considerable amount of parcel traffic, including seasonal supplies of fresh fruits for the local hotels and campsites. As the major holiday resort of Calvi swings into view, the beach starts to get noticeably more crowded. This particular stretch of coastal railway has proved to be popular not only with the public, but also with SNCF, who frequently use photos taken along here for publicity purposes. It's not unusual to find the line along here completely covered by sand after winter storms. But at this time of year, the main problems are unobservant holidaymakers and people who've parked their cars too close to the track. The usual remedy for inconsiderate parking is for the train to gently nudge the car out of the way. Nowadays, the line terminates at the end of the platforms here in Calvi. But back in the 1980s, they used to extend right along the harbour side, tramway fashion. For many thousands of people, Calvi offers the ideal family holiday resort. There's plenty of reasonably priced tourist hotels and lots of safe swimming and water sports on offer. The area around the 15th century citadel is particularly appealing and ideal to stroll around. You'll find a good selection of seafood restaurants along the old harbour quayside, although prices are considerably cheaper out of town. Rather than commercial shipping, the harbour tends to be full of private yachts and charter craft of all sizes. The location of Calvi probably makes it the favourite choice for a first holiday visit to Corsica if you want to combine a beach holiday with some railway interest. Back on the main line to Ajaccio, there's a surprise in the form of regular freight traffic, albeit in a very reduced form. Even in pre-war steam days, there was never very much freight, and what there was was mostly conveyed in mixed trains.
Today there's just one booked daily freight service linking Bastia and Ajaccio, running north and south on alternate days. At present there's a total fleet of eight of these two-car Soule units. Each unit is equipped with two 177 kilowatt diesel engines, which means they've plenty of power to tackle the steepest parts of the line. The fare structure on the island is unique to SNCF and bears little resemblance to mainland rates. and mainland rail passes are not valid. Over the years, a wide variety of liveries have appeared, with the SNCF regional blue and white now becoming standard. Perhaps the most famous structure on the line is the splendid Vecchio Viaduct. This 140 metre long steel girder bridge was designed by no less a person than Gustav Eiffel. The two car Soule units which dominate passenger services are well suited to this type of operation and have brought new standards of comfort and reliability to the island's lines. As the dramatic mountains of Gravone are left behind, the line descends almost continuously all the way to Journey's End at Ajaccio on the coast. Ajaccio is a noisy and busy town, not particularly likely to attract many tourists as a holiday resort, even though it can claim to be the birthplace of no less a person than Napoleon Bonaparte himself. Close to the main terminus station at Ajaccio, the railway runs on a reserve track down the centre of a very busy main road through an area known as Les Salines, although all trace of the salt pans have long since been eradicated by the high-rise apartments and hotels. Although there were grand plans for the railway to reach the attractive southernmost town of Bonifacio, the line never did get there, which is a pity because this attractive port is today very busy indeed with daily sailings to Sardinia, which would no doubt generate plenty of potential rail traffic. In fact, the closest the railway came to reaching here was when it served Porto Vecchio, only 22 kilometres north, on the old East Coast route some 60 years ago. In high season, there are up to four car ferry sailings each way per day to the Italian island of Sardinia, although out of season this drops to only two sailings each way per day. Customs formalities are observed, although in practice the delays are minimal, and at least passengers have the benefit of purchasing duty-free drinks and cigarettes on board during the 65 minutes or so crossing the Straits of Bonifacio. On fine days there are marvellous views of the ancient fortified old town of Bonifacio, which clings precariously to the cliff top. Although separated by only 12 kilometres of sea across the Strait of Bonifacio, the Italian island of Sardinia is very different from Corsica, both in scenic and nationalistic terms. The island, which is the second largest in the Mediterranean, is almost three times the size of Corsica, with a population of 1,650,000 people, which means it can support a surprisingly profuse and varied railway network. 
Sardinia's state-run standard gauge main line connects Golfo Aranci in the northeast with Cagliari in the south, with the addition of two important branches to Igesias and Sassari. There are also the remnants of a very interesting and comprehensive narrow gauge network. Golfo Aranci is the terminal for the freight-only train ferry from Civita Vecchia on the Italian mainland just northwest of Rome. There are four of the distinctive D145-2001 class locos shedded on the island at Sassari, but normally outstationed here for train ferry workings. Freight traffic predominates on the branch line from Golfo Aranci to Olbia, the usual motive power being provided by green liveried class D443 units, which were built in the late 1960s. Unlike the neighbouring island of Corsica, there is considerable rail freight across the length of Sardinia, as many of the principal commodities have to be imported. There are two subclasses of the D443s fitted with Fiat engines, and some of this subclass are equipped for multiple unit operation. These are often worked in pairs or triple headed, and the use of four engines isn't unknown, usually indicating a positioning move to provide a return working for the freight services from Monti. Old Sardinia boasts no less than 1,850 kilometres of coastline. In fact, just about a quarter of Italy's entire coastal boundary. The sea is literally never more than an hour's drive away by car, and there's plenty of appealing scenery like this, particularly in the northeast, a part known as the Costa Smeralda. Passenger services between Olbia and Cagliari are normally handled by these typical Italian rail cars. In this case, the two-car unit comprises an ALN 663 leading and an ALN 668 trailing. Sardinia's first concession to build a railway was granted as long ago as 1862. But although there was obvious potential for a line to link the remote communities, it proved hard to finance. Progress towards building the first private line was slow, as without government backing it was difficult to raise the enormous funds required. Although construction commenced northwards from Cagliari in 1863, it had to stop five years later due to lack of money. Virtually the whole of the standard gauge network is single track, with much of it passing through the typically wild and barren Sardinian countryside. Line speeds aren't particularly high, with the fastest train covering the 260 kilometres between Sassari and Cagliari in around two and a half hours, although most are much slower due to the number of intermediate stops. Like the neighbouring island of Corsica, there's very little in the way of true forest on the island of Sardinia. Much of the central plain is used for wheat production, while in the more hilly areas it's still common to see shepherds tending large flocks of sheep, which produce the distinctive pecorino cheeses. The shepherds' traditional way of life has scarcely changed over the centuries, as there's little scope to use this poor hilly land for any other agricultural purpose. 
If you're touring by car, finding accommodation inland can often be quite tricky. Even the larger towns like Makoma have only two hotels, while many of the more remote towns and villages have only very limited resources. While some resorts suffer from total redevelopment that seems to have completely obliterated the original character, there are still many attractive and comparatively unspoiled villages to stay in. One particularly interesting rural line that until now has remained virtually intact is the narrow gauge line from Makoma in the centre of the island east to the busy town of Nuoro. Situated on the edge of the Marguin Mountains, Makoma, high above the huge Borore Plain, is comparatively well served by both narrow gauge and mainline services. gauge line extends right into the mainline station to meet the few mainline trains that make a timetable connection. After literally only a few hundred meters, the line crosses a busy main road and turns a full 180 degrees to then stop at the main Makoma narrow gauge station which is situated almost directly across the road from the standard gauge main line station. Most services these days are in the hands of these single motor ADE 01 class rail cars, of which 20 were built with electric transmission in 1957. Back on the standard gauge main line, not all services are railcar operated. Each day there are at least three through workings from Cagliari to Kilivani and back, hauled by Class D445s. The D445s are fitted with both train heating supply and push-pull equipment. Unfortunately, the Italian teenager's love for graffiti reached the island some time ago. At present, the rail journey along the 214 kilometres from the capital city of Cagliari north to Kilivani will take around four hours, even by the fastest train. However, if some of the latest political promises are to be believed, pendolinos will be introduced on these intercity services at some time in the not-too-distant future. Unfortunately, some mention needs to be made about the attitude of both FS and in particular the railway police who can be found based at many stations. It's not an exaggeration to say that out of all the countries, including communists, that the Telerail team have filmed in, surprisingly, Italy has proved to be the most uncooperative. The official rule is no tripods on platforms under any circumstances and no railway photography without a permit. But as the official railway authorities refuse to answer letters, faxes or phone calls, the only sensible option is to be discreet. Apart from the daily loco haul trains, the majority of services throughout the island are in the hands of these ALN 668 railcars. These highly successful Fiat railcars were built in batches from 1956 until 1983.
the largest remaining network of narrow-gauge lines connects Cagliari to Sorgono in the centre of the island and Arbatax on the eastern coast, although much of the system is currently not in daily use. During 1997, several portions of the narrow-gauge main line north of Dolianova Serdiana were out of action due to extensive upgrading of the track to Senorbi. However, a restricted service from Senorbi to the junction station at Mandas was still busy carrying locals and school children. Until 1998, all the remaining sections of the narrow-gauge system were administered by the Ferrovia della Sardegna. The company seemed to be very positive, and unlike FS, were always very helpful to rail fans. However, the Italian government has now decided to take the narrow-gauge lines into the state FS network. Mandas station in the mountains is the junction for the line to Arbatax and Sorgono. Although the section past Isili on the line to Sorgono hasn't operated for some time, with the track being retained on the familiar care and maintenance basis. Symbolic of the unrealistic operating costs, the line has many unmanned level crossings and these are usually operated by staff who arrive by car several minutes before the train passes. Ironically, as in this case, the road is little more than an unmade track with no road traffic at all. The section north from Mandas to the physical junction of the line these days sees little regular passenger action, except the shuttle service to and from Isili. From 1998, the 159 km section from Mandas to Arbatax is also to be closed to all regular traffic. This is a terrible shame, as out of all the lines in Sardinia, the Mandas to Arbatax is considered by many people to be the most scenic. In the past few years, a considerable effort has been made to market this section of line as a tourist attraction, using both rail cars and occasional steam services, with some success under the banner Il Trenino Verde. of the EC and the Sardinian Tourist Office, funding was agreed some time ago for the restoration of many of the stations and railway houses along this section of the line. The oldest loco currently available is this Swiss-built 260 tank, which dates from 1894. It was restored in 1996 at Monserrato Depot Cagliari, with the boiler being sent to a private firm in Cagliari for attention. Steam hauled specials, particularly in this beautiful area, have become increasingly common in recent years, and many of these have been chartered specifically by groups of rail fans from both Germany and the United Kingdom. The ancient landscape in this extremely remote corner of Sardinia has remained virtually unaltered for centuries.
Although during recent years there's been a very limited timetabled summer steam service from various parts of the narrow gauge network, this was frequently cancelled for what was described as fire risks. Between Sui and Usasasi, the line follows a ledge high up the side of a major gorge. Frequently the route has to digress up side canyons before returning to the main valley, although in some cases a costly viaduct has enabled a considerable saving in distance. Eventually, the remote port of Arbatax will be reached after a journey of some four hours. It seems somewhat ironic that this section, with its stunning scenery, can only survive by reverting to a steam hauled service with a hundred year old loco. These days, the vast majority of tourists to all the islands featured in this program tend to fly in on package tours. It's quick and convenient. The islands aren't served by scheduled direct services from the UK, so you'll have to change flights either in France or Italy, depending on which country's national airline you're using. For independent travellers from the UK, it's well worth shopping around. There are often spare seats available on charter flights at realistic prices. These can be very convenient, offering considerable time-saving direct flights to most of the islands from UK regional airports. For instance, Air UK fly weekly from Manchester to Corsica, saving at least four hours on any other way of reaching the island from the north of England. The alternative, if you have plenty of time, is to take the ferry. Regular overnight services operate from a wide variety of French and Italian ports to Corsica and Sardinia. Travellers to Sicily can take the shortest crossing from the Italian tow, which is less than an hour, or sail south overnight from Naples to Palermo, the capital of Sicily. For the most part, the island of Sicily comprises of a high plateau, with the notable exception of several mountain ranges and the volcanic Mount Etna. With the prospect of seeing its ancient towns and many fine Roman remains, this is another exciting island to visit. The Italian island of Sicily is the largest island in the Mediterranean and supports a population of nearly 5 million people. The railway is managed by the Italian State Railway, 
and of the islands featured in this programme, it's the only one to operate modern main lines to European Express standards, a fair proportion of which have also been electrified. One of the most attractive rural sections of line in Sicily is the circular route from the principal city of Palermo to Trapani and Mazzara in the southwest of the island. Palermo's impressive main station was built in 1886 in a suitably eclectic style, mingling classical and Renaissance themes, so as not to appear out of place with the rest of the city's varied and inspiring architectural gems. The hustle and bustle of this huge city, with its sprawling modern suburbs, are quickly left behind as the line heads south towards the junction station of Alcamo. The superb scenery is typical of this part of the island, with only the lower slopes being able to support, in the main, grapes, olives, oranges and lemons. All of the services are in the hands of either ALN 668 railcars, just like those in Sardinia, or the similar ALN 663 units. After leaving Al Camo, the 47km branch line west to the significant port of Trapani heads high into the mountains. In contrast to the new motorway, the line has to twist and turn through two giant horseshoes to gain height. Isolated and now derelict station at Segesta Tempio is typical of a building that should, in reality, never have been more than a halt. The village it serves is some considerable distance away and there were never very many passengers. So the only real benefit in constructing such a building in the 1930s was to provide work for the unemployed of Sicily. The FS diesel rail cars were built in the early 1980s and were designed for light branch line operations like this. The line south from Al Camo also serves Trapani, but by a far more circuitous 117 km route, first heading to Mazzara before following the coast back northwards to Trapani. The secondary main line across Sicily between Palermo and Catania was finally electrified in 1995 when the last section from Rocca Palumba was energised. This means that the entire northeast of the island benefits from electrified routes. At Caltanissetta, the line from Agrigento on the coast joins the eastern route from Catania to Palermo. With most of the services comprising of lightly loaded DMUs, many people would doubt the viability of electrification. However, some services are operated by two-car ALE 582 electric multiple units. This splendid viaduct near to Caltanissetta certainly looks in keeping with many of Sicily's antiquities. Built in the late 1980s and allocated to Palermo, this ALE582 two-car electric multiple unit would look smart in its new suburban grey livery, lined out in red and orange, if it hadn't had the attention of some Sicilian teenagers. Of course, the main benefit of electrification is for freight and Italian mainland-bound passenger services. Many of these are operated by elderly Class E636s, still in their original brown livery. These are still the most numerous class of loco in Italy, although withdrawals are now taking place. There's roughly one semi-fast train an hour for the 243-kilometre journey between the major cities of Palermo and Catania. This is a highly recommended trip, passing through some particularly lovely and unspoiled rural areas, 
well away from the usual tourist haunts and grounds. It's also a very pleasant journey travelling south from Roca Palumba to Agrigento. Agrigento is well known for its impressive complex of Greek buildings in an area known as the Valley of the Temples, which includes the beautifully preserved Temple of Concord. The most unexpected pleasures as far as railways are concerned in Sicily is the narrow gauge Circum Etnia Railway, which, as its name suggests, runs virtually right around the still active Mount Etna. Built in 1895, this unusual line forms a giant semicircle around Mount Etna, leaving the standard gauge main line along the coast to form the rest of the circle. The 950mm narrow gauge station at Giare is only a short walk from the main line station of Giare Riposto, although it's not signposted in any way and can be difficult to find. The company have made some notable attempts at cost cutting, but many manned level crossings are still in operation. The immense cone of Mount Etna, which at 3,323 metres is the highest active volcano in Europe, dominates the whole area, and molten lava flows have often poured onto the lower slopes. Usually it's been possible to relay track over the cooled lava bed fairly quickly and resume services again. Although in the 1920s the line had to be worked in two sections for several years after a major eruption. Until as late as 1961, when the occasional mixed goods still ran, Randazzo Depot echoed to the sound of steam locos but today it's only used as a stabling point. Typical of the more modern looking motive power is this ADE21 diesel electric rail car, which was built in Catania during the early 1990s. There's been a proposal to convert this section from Randazzo to Catania to a standard gauge electrified section, which would certainly make good operating, if not financial sense. However, like so many Italian island projects, this looks set to remain on the drawing board for at least some time to come. Adrano and Paterno are the only other sizable towns on the route before the coast is regained at Catania. Older units like this, now repainted in the new livery, date from the 1970s. This unusual line as it exists today certainly doesn't pay, although for the time being at least the government seemed content to continue subsidising the route. Not surprisingly, the busiest area for rail action on the island is concentrated around the northeastern corner of Sicily, where passenger and freight services converge on Messina from both the north and east coast main lines. Messina is a constant hive of activity, with ferries of all sizes on the move all day and night. Despite having suffered extensively from earthquakes and being heavily bombed during World War II, the town still has a pleasant historic feel about it and is well worth exploring. For the present, all rail traffic is carried to and from Sicily on a fleet of ships run by FS. As well as rail freight, there are also regular through passenger train services to carry all of which means that there's enough volume of traffic to keep ships sailing hourly, most carrying cars, lorries and trains, with a few sailings restricted to cars only.
The eastern route from Messina to Catania was electrified to 3,000 volts DC in 1958, with the rest of the line to Syracuse being energized two years later. This portion of the coast features some of the most popular beaches in Sicily, although it has to be said many have been ravaged by years of indiscriminate coastal development. However, in areas where there's only limited car parking, and for those prepared to walk, there are still some unspoiled sections of shore. E-636s are still common on passenger services along this 95 km section to Catania, with journey times a respectable 90 minutes for the fastest services. We do hope that you've enjoyed this look at the fascinating railways of Corsica, Sardinia and Sicily. As we've seen during the course of this program, these three Mediterranean islands vary enormously each having its own very distinctive flavour. Whatever your final destination, we're certain that you won't be disappointed as they all offer that fascinating combination that so often eludes us in the UK of sun, scenery and railway action. Bye for now. After viewing this program, you'll be spoiled for choice. The beautiful French island of Corsica, which is the fourth largest Mediterranean island, has a population of only 250,000 people, with most of the principal towns being situated close to the sea. Corsica is served by a single-track main line from Bastia to Ajaccio, which is connected with a branch line from Pontilecchia to Calvi. The island's meter gauge railway network is part of the state-owned SNCF system and in recent years has benefited from considerable new investment in rolling stock. The majority of the most popular beaches in Corsica are on the west coast and are well served by rail. The interior of the island is very mountainous, with its highest peak reaching over 2,700 metres. And as we shall see, this distinctive scenery has effectively shaped the development of the whole railway network. The northern terminus station at Bastia is situated close to the lengthy Toretta Tunnel, which bores deep under the old city. Today, standard power for all Bastia to...
Hello and welcome to Railroad Journeys Around the World. There can be few people who don't occasionally dream about escaping from the stress and strain of everyday life to their own relaxing island in the sun. Of course, for most of us, the reality is a compromise with all the family as we search for our ideal annual holiday spot. The answer for many thousands of people from all over Europe is to flock to the Mediterranean islands in search of sunshine, beautiful beaches and distinctive regional cuisine. Surely though, the ideal holiday island would feature all of these things in abundance. But also perhaps an interesting railway network that could be used to explore the island and provide a pleasant diversion from all that sunbathing, swimming and overeating. See single units like this without a control trailer. Passengers from Ajaccio for the Calvi branch always have to change here, while any through trains to Calvi from Bastia will have to reverse here, usually adding or detaching a trailer in the process before continuing their journey. Approximately 30 minutes is timetabled between connections here, which out of season allows plenty of time to visit the station cafe. In high summer, though, there's usually a scramble for passengers from Calvi trying to get a seat onwards to Ajaccio on an already well-filled train. Corsica is sometimes known as the scented isle, and the air is often heavy with the smell of pungent wild herbs and shrubs frequently emanating from the so-called turpentine plant. Through trains from Calvi to Bastia will take around three hours, although late running, usually caused by animals on the track or even minor landslides, are common. Ajaccio services are these two-car Sule diesel hydraulic units, which were introduced in 1989. Bastia Depot was also the site of the main workshops until 1983, when a new facility was opened at Casamozza, some 22 kilometers south. The modern station building at Bastia was financed and built in 1982, when surplus railway land, including the branch to the harbour, was sold off. After traversing a rather dull and level coastal plain, shortly after leaving Casamozza, the line begins its dramatic climb into the mountains along the valley of the river Golo. On the final approach to Ponte Lecchia, the line parallels the branch from Calvi for a short distance before joining it just before the station. Most services are operated by Sule railcars in pairs and it's comparatively unusual to